Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's good to be back. And I, I think uh, every time I've been here, I've reminded the audience that I get a little apprehensive about the introductions, and I brace myself at introduction time because I've been savaged over the years by you know, inadvertence, perhaps, on a couple of occasions, uh, deliberate introductions. Um, I, I, I shared with this audience, I know, a while back, the most memorable of those, which was an introduction to the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, in 1983. I can hear people laughing already because they remember it. It actually happened. Pat Moynihan thought I should be introduced to the President and tried at an affair early in 1983, my first year. We walked up to the President. Pat said, um, Mr. President, I'd like to introduce to you. And before he could get my name out of his mouth, President Reagan cocked his head the way he would and gave that smile that melts all resistance. He said, oh, you don't have to introduce us. I know Lee Iacocca well. You know, I, <laughs> no, actually happened. And uh, as I've said so many times before, for one terrible moment, they came surging up from the most profound recesses of my psyche, the response, the almost irresistible response that a kid from Queens would make to a crack like that, and that's all I was and all I'll ever be as a kid from Queens, but prudence uh, bit it, spat it out. I was going to say, I know, Mr. President, to some people we all look alike, but I did not <laughs> say that. And I can go on with these. Uh, the, the, there was another by a Republican. These actually happened. A Republican mayor was unhappy with the budget I'd given him. He was unhappy with the fact that I was alive, actually. But, <laughs> and he had been forced to introduce me by circumstance a number of times. And with some irritation, he, int he introduced me, uh, deciding he would get even, at least try to get even. And he said, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, and uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, because you know who he is, and he's been introduced over and over. And as a matter of fact, just to make sure I give you something a little bit fresh on it, I went to the dictionary for help. He said the next speaker is Mario Cuomo. <laughs> he is, from the dictionary, a governor. Dictionary definition, a device attached to a machine to see that it does not operate at maximum efficiency. <laughs> Hey, you know, what, what is most irritating about that particular joke, which happens to be an actual situation, is that everybody laughs at it. And uh, when you're a governor, you understand why that can be disconcerting. I, I'll have to be especially efficient tonight, because I, what I've been asked to talk about is not so much a single significant subject like Iraq or, or the economy, or even a whole batch of them, like California and Iraq and the economy and the upcoming election, <laughs> but rather to mention some or all of those issues and point to the sum total of them and the significance of them and what they mean or imply to the question, where are we as a nation? And it, it, what direction are we traveling in? And is it a good direction? And if not, how do we correct it? Now, that's an awful lot for any audience, but if there's any audience that can handle it, and I don't mean to blow smoke, it's the 92nd Street Y, and it's the reason that I and so many people come back uh, almost uh, 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 unfailingly when invited. Uh, the, the diversity of the place, now I've lived in the city all my life and I know it well, and I can identify it easily, but the, the tremendous diversity, the cumulative wisdom that's represented here, the cumulative dozens and dozens of religions and cultures, uh, all of it gathered together just to listen, to think, to speak, and, and to decide. Uh, I have been instructed by you many times in the discussion period, and I'm sure I will be again today. So I look forward to that because some of the questions that are raised by what's happening today are extremely important ones. Let me get the discussion started. The United States is indubitably the greatest nation in world history. We all know that. Its economy is the largest. It's um, 
military force is the, the last of the great military forces and dominant in the world. Uh, no one even approaches us in the strength of the military. And as an engine of opportunity, as I've said so many times in the past, no country in the world has the record for having provided opportunity to people who would not have had it in the place where they were born, perhaps 11 generations of them, people like my mother and father, who came from another part of the world, uneducated, with very little hope for uh, a capacity to live any kind of civil existence, came here and lived well, thanks to this miracle of a place. And the, the story goes on and on, and there is no question that most of the world that is not here would like to be here, or much of it at least, and very few people who are here except uh, for an occasional greedy business that figures out it can beat the taxes by moving out, very few of the people here want to leave. So that goes without any kind of debate. We are the greatest nation in the world, and if that is your objective, to become the most powerful, the strongest, and the best engine of opportunity, then we need not try to do anything more. But the truth is, despite that, despite the tremendous capacity we have with technology that has demonstrated over the last 60 years and created more progress than we had for 600 years before it, uh, with uh, uh, robotic operations and traveling to the moon and now stem cells and now perhaps even the possibility that a woman could clone herself. Imagine, it would render all males irrelevant, actually. <laughs> Which, you, you would be like amoebas, you know, magnificent female amoebas crawling off into a corner and producing other amoebae, you know, just as beautiful as she, uh, rendering us just pictures on the wall, tattered and yellowing. We, we, have, we have the capacity for all of this, but despite that, despite the fact that in a lifetime we've made the surreal commonplace, the truth is we as a nation have not become yet as civil, as fair, and as efficient a society as we are capable of being. And therefore, we have not justified the good fortune that we've already enjoyed. If we can be better, if we can provide more opportunity and allow people to live better than they're living in this country now, if we have the capacity to do that, and if it's obvious that that capacity is there and we're not using it, then we have no excuse. And that would have to be a matter of shame for us because we have been treated so well. The notion of not spreading that the benefits of our good fortune when it is relatively easy to do, would be unforgivable. And it appears to me that's the position we're in. We find it difficult to live without wars. War has become endemic, certainly in my lifetime, the Second World War on. We finished the millennium, and now we start with still more wars, suggesting that perhaps that's the way this next millennium will be as well. We're the wealthiest nation in the world, no doubt about that. There are more billionaires, billionaires I said, and millionaires and people over $200,000 than ever before in our history. There is no doubt of it. And that's an emphatic affirmation of the efficiency of our free enterprise system, at least in producing great wealth. But that 2%, that, but that, that tier of super wealthy people is only 2% of the American population. Only 2%. One in five of our 160 million workers is high skilled. Only one in five. The rest, their productivity hobbled by a lack of adequate education and training, earn modest wages, and their living conditions are worsening. Guess what the average wage is in the United States of America? 42,000. $400 for a household, $42,400, only five high skilled. Just how much can it skill more insistent here? Eight million last couple of years. American workers 
out of work at the moment. If, in fact, businesses are getting any better, and we're said uh, that uh, only, only an economist would believe this uh, because uh, the reality of it seems astonishingly contradictory of it, the recession started in March of 2001. Guess when it ended? In November of 2001. Oh, we haven't been in recession since then? Oh, no. You just had 9 million people out of work and you lost 3 million jobs and workers who make 1% more a year in wages, if they're lucky enough to work, they're sliding downward toward the bottom of the uh, mountain because health care is going up 12% a year in costs and education is going up and housing is going up and transportation is going up. And so if you're making 42000 and you got 1% more in wages and all those costs went up, what happens? If you don't get a second job, you just slide back downward. Now that's if you're lucky enough to have a job. And when you slide all the way down, you land with 35 million people who are already there at the bottom. We're the richest nation in world history. You know how rich we are. You've seen the wealth. You saw 700 of the millionaires and billionaires testify together in a really magnificent moment led by William H. Gates III, that's Bill Gates' father, pleading with the Congress of the United States not to exempt their estates from taxation, which was a wonderful, lovely moment. I mean, you know, for 700 of these, but just the might that was represented there, the power that was represented there. That's the United States of America that put those people in that room and that created that power. How then can it be that you have 11 million children at risk? At risk of what? At risk of inadequate education. At risk of failure in this life. At risk of um, uh, being a, an infant of two or three years of age in a place like South Jamaica, Queens, my old neighborhood and being emptied out into the streets, you know, to be surrounded by pimps and prostitutes and degradation of all kind. You know, I have said over and over, and it's true, that there are children in this country, in circumstances like that, who become familiar with the sound of gunfire before they've ever heard an orchestra play. How can it be? How can you live that way? How can you, some years ago in Philadelphia, recall when President Clinton gathered together President Carter and President Ford and, and uh, Colin Powell and spoke to the volunteers of America and said we have 15 million children at risk. And the volunteers, the Jewish Federation, the Catholic Charities, all the great philanthropies, you must do more because these children may be lost to us. And that's a tragedy and a sin, and it's also bad for the economy because they, in their disorientation, will become sick with drugs, etc. They will be a 15-year-old girl who decides that there's no point in staying in school because the school is terrible, and there's no jobs for her after it anyway. And all the young people in the community have gone off to jail. And in some communities, you know that to be a fact. So she chooses to have a baby. Why? Why not? That was her affirmation of herself. With that kind of thing happening in this world, the richest nation on the planet. Well, it seems to me we're doing something wrong. Millions of elderly can't afford prescription drugs. How do you justify it? What do we say to ourselves? Well, of course, you know, look, it's a free enterprise system. Some winners, some losers. That's the nature of free enterprise. It's an absurdity. It's a travesty. It's wrong. In effect, much of America is struggling more than we should have to. Now, these problems are more difficult to deal with today because of the huge and growing federal deficit and debt hanging like a great albatross around Uncle Sam's neck, as well as state and local governments that are running. This year, cumulatively, state and local governments, $100 billion in deficit. Well, what does that mean, deficit? And let's get this clear. One of the reasons we don't solve these problems is the semantics of it. Most Americans don't know what deficit means. 
I mean, they, if you gave them an examination, they could probably write a reasonably intelligent definition. But in this context, they don't know what it means. They don't know that the federal government can run a deficit beyond numerals because there is nothing to stop it. Since it has a money machine, it's not required to balance the budget. It can run as far behind as the politicians in Washington choose it to. On the other hand, the city of New York can't and the state of New York can't. They must balance their budget at the end of the year. And that's why Mike Bloomberg had to do what he had to do. And I did what I had to do when I was there through two recessions. Well, what does deficit mean? Deficit means you get less money that year than you needed to pay your bills that year. The federal government now has the largest deficits it ever had. That's only a few years, two years after it had the greatest surplus it ever had. And the deficits now will go to something like $600 billion next year. We'll be $600 billion behind what we spend. What? And how much, how much Mario, is there altogether? Well, there's already $4 trillion. Four tri are, you, are you serious? No, no, no. The business, the, the, the numbers are so large that people don't notice them. The enormity of them is so overwhelming that you don't even deal with it. Because if you actually deal, dealt with it, if you stopped all the prime time shows and instead said, listen, we have an election coming up, let's get some things clear. We're in deep doo-doo when it comes to the numbers here. Here's what debt means. Here's what's going to happen when uh, the next generation lives to be 100 years old and the birth rate is as low as it is now and you stop finally the flow of immigrants in. You're not going to have enough workers to make enough money to pay for those old people and their Medicare and their Social Security. And don't kid you yourself. The debts you have right now to those people who are on their way to becoming 80 and 90 years of age, you can't pay for them now with all the workers you have now and all the workers you're projecting. You're in for a big shock. If you said that, there'd be conversations, there'd be meetings in this hall, and people would be saying, we want to know what's happening here. Now, uh, regrettably, I know the numbers. And that's why you hear this exasperation in my voice. And you hear it especially when I think that with all these problems we had, with children who need education, with seniors who need prescription drugs, with 43 million people who are not protected by health care. Now just think about that. Put yourself in that position. You're not old enough for Medicare. You're not poor enough for Medicaid. You're a secretary who makes $28,000 a year and you don't have a health care plan from the firm because you're an itinerant. You go from here to there, you do spot work, etc. You also have a 17-year-old daughter, brilliant daughter on her way to college, and you want, that, that, that's your life. You're a single parent and a son who's younger. You're not going to worry about him now, but you're going to see to it that, that uh, uh, Emily gets her, her opportunity in college, and you're breaking your back to do it, but you don't have health insurance because it would cost you nine and a half thousand, uh, $9,000 uh, for the policy, and you get breast cancer. Well, that means you can't pay for it. No, you can't pay for it, but that doesn't mean you don't get an operation. It won't be the operation that wealthy people will get, perhaps, but it'll be an operation, and it'll be good, and good Lord willing, she lives. But you'll be bankrupted. We set a record for personal bankruptcies last year. That's about the fifth year in a row that we set records for personal bankruptcies. And people are way up over their limit in credit cards. That's all the reality of the United States of America. And it was in 2001 when we thought we had the biggest surplus in history. Now, here was the moral, fiscal, economic, political, question for all the liberals and all the conservatives and all those who were none of those two but are interested in the country. The question was, what do we do now with the largest surplus in world history, billions of dollars left behind by the Clinton administration? And the decision was by the United States of America, now listen carefully to the numbers, they're in the almanac, you can test me, 
the decision by you and me and our leaders, and it's you and me because some Democrats voted, Republicans voted, and we let it happen, and nobody marched on the Capitol, was to cut taxes $2 trillion. $2 trillion. I didn't say billion. $2 trillion. Wow. No, no, no. The wow comes now. 40% of it went to the top 1.5% of the taxpayers. That's fewer than 2 million taxpayers. That's a trillion dollars. To the richest people in America. On what theory? Well, pure fairness. The president, well, it is, it is. It was pure fairness arithmetically. The president announced very simply, we don't need the money, and therefore we'll give it back to the people who gave it to us. The people who gave it were the wealthiest people. That's what a progressive tax system is. Remember, this wasn't a property tax. It wasn't Social Security tax. It's the income tax, which theoretically and to some extent practically reflects wealth. And so, yes, maybe they gave you the trillion dollars, but now you gave it back. Tell me again why. Because we didn't need it. But well, what about all the numbers Mario just gave us? Oh, come on. He's, well, he's a mushy-headed liberal, you know. So, <laughs> so you got a few old people. You got a few sick people. What, what do you want? Perfection, you know? That's the way it is in this world. That's the way it is in a free enterprise system. That's an absurdity. And then, of course, most of this gets eclipsed. This, you, you, didn't, you haven't heard anybody doing this kind of negative litany before. Not recently. Why? Because it all got eclipsed on 9-11. And I can under, understand that. That day changed the world, changed mine, changed yours, changed everybody's world here in the United States, here in New York in particular, but, but everyone, everywhere. And since then, we've become involved in the troubled occupation and attempted nation building in Afghanistan and Iraq, creating, as I noted, the grim suspicion that the new millennium will be as war-ridden as the last one was. Our Iraqi experience already has cost us more American lives than we lost in combat, just trying to occupy the place because we simply weren't prepared for it. We didn't do it right. We weren't expecting what we got, and, and the, the, there's no point in trying to argue about that. That's a reality, and we all know it. You know, the number we don't hear, though, is 60,000 Iraqis killed. Now, how many of them were guilty? How many of them were Saddam Hussein? And how many of them were innocent? You don't even hear the number. There's something wrong with that, too, that you're not even given the number of Iraqis who were killed by that war, who were children, women, men, who were innocent. These weren't even soldiers. Many of their soldiers died as well. Iraq, according to Lugar, who is the head of the, the committee, the Republican head of the committee that is most relevant here, and who was a terrific, terrific senator, he said this morning that we could be in Iraq for as much as seven more years. And the original number was it'll cost us $100 billion. Now, that's only a billion. I've been talking trillions here. But that's only a, a billion, a hundred billion, a hundred. What's a hundred billion? I'll tell you what a hundred billion is. Just imagine a hundred cities in trouble, each of them being given a billion dollars. What difference would that make to the United States of America? How many old people could get prescription drugs? How many young people could get a better education? How many women with breast cancer wouldn't have to be on their knees praying for a special break from somebody because for God's sakes, what happens to me now? I can't help Emily. I can't help my son. I probably won't be able to work. They took my car. A hundred billion dollars more in Iraq. One trillion dollars to the richest people in America. But now you know you're in trouble. Now you know the economy was lousy. This isn't what happened in 2001 when you gave us this $2 trillion tax cut. Okay, you're telling me you were fooled by the surplus then. 
But now it's a couple of years later. Now 9-11 has occurred. Now you know about the war in ter uh, against terrorism. You know we need to spend money on it. You know that the economy is going down the tubes. That's become clear to everybody. You see the people who are being laid off. You see the executives being manacled and dragged away. And you know we're losing billions of dollars out of corruption in the system. How dare you say now that we don't need the money? Now what do you do? Now you give us another tax cut. Am I making this up? I mean, it, 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 am I exaggerating this? Isn't that what happened? And where were we? Where were they? Wasn't there somebody who stood up and said, wait a minute, this is madness. What's the point of it, this new tax cut? Oh, now we're going to stimulate the economy. Stimulate what economy? How, how do you stimulate the economy? By giving a trillion dollars to the rich people. We're not short of money for rich people. We're not short of investor capital. If there's anything wrong with the economy, it is that the businesses aren't doing business because people don't have the money to go in and buy the shoes they need or the roof on the house they need. The investors are all sitting there with their money waiting to invest it when the businesses do well. We don't need investment capital. There's plenty of investment capital. We need consumer money in an economy that's 65% consumption. If you had given the money to the workers who make $42,400 or less or a little bit more, they would spend it in the economy right away. Why? Because they need to. I won't spend it. Thank God. When I was governor, I would have spent it. I was broke. But thank God you elected me a private citizen, and now I'm not broke anymore. <laughs> we would like to cut short the Iraqi experience. How? By bringing in our friends, the French, <laughs> and the Germans. Germans are not as reluctant as the French, but bringing them in. They're a little reluctant to come. Why? Well, we had this discussion with them about Iraq. And uh, they didn't think we should go there. And they said, you're not ready to go. And Bob Graham told you, you shouldn't go. And Bob Graham said you should finish the job in Afghanistan because the Taliban will come back if you leave now. Incidentally, the Taliban's are back. And, uh, you know, so, so, so the, I'm afraid that's not going very well. And beyond all of that, look, look over the world. You know, we should be helping the rest of the world. We're the richest people in the world. And we have some kind of obligation to do what we can for others in the world. And 25 million people die in Africa. How many? 25 million? How many more? Well, a whole lot of million more. Did you read the story in the, I guess it was the Times today? Or maybe it was yesterday. What a story. Father, 38 years old, on HIV, AIDS, like so many, has children to take care of and a spouse, young man, but he's the father of the house. So he has the drugs and he takes them to stay alive. But his 10 year old, 11 year old daughter is going to die because he had to make the judgment. Who gets the drugs, her or me? What? Why? Well, because we just, but didn't, didn't we say we we're gonna give 15 billion? Well, we said we we're gonna give 15 billion, we made it a billion and we haven't given it yet. Well, couldn't, well, yeah, but they're not our children. Of course they're your children. 25 million Africans are absolutely the same as 25 million New Yorkers from Manhattan. Absolutely the same. Okay, now if you, if, you, if you just take all of this, and I'd, I'd better speed because I, I, get, I get weary of the, the, the negative litany and eager to get to the positive stuff. But when you look at these unmet challenges and these apocalyptic threats and these squandered opportunities looming all around us and you search for hope in the current political discussions, it's, it's difficult not to be disappointed. And that's not because we lack intelligent politicians who are Republican, intelligent politicians who are Democrat. And uh, it's not that at all. And it's not that we lack good candidates on the Democratic side. I think this is an extraordinary field. I really do. 
And, uh, and, and, but, but I think there's something, there's something about the process. Uh, there's, there's, there's something about the way we do it. Right now we have nine uh, of the ten original candidates, and they all speak intelligently. Carol Mosley Braun, have you ever said, heard her say anything that wasn't really intelligent, especially on health care, etc.? All of them, even the ones we, we know the least. They have points of view you may disagree with, but they all speak intelligently, but they're all speaking at once, and that produces a babble. That's what babble means. It doesn't mean a lack of intelligence or a lack of cogency. It means you're speaking in different tongues, and so we can't understand. If they were a chorus all saying the same thing, incidentally, that's what the Democrats should try to do, is to get them into a chorus. And if you look closely to the points... If, if you listen closely to the points I'm making here, I think four or five of them, after a preamble, four or five of them would do very nicely as an agenda that they could all agree on. For example, tax cuts, just to leap way ahead. The, now, the difference between the, and among the candidates on the tax cuts, first of all, some of them voted for the tax cuts, regrettably, and they're going to have to explain that, but the, the difference is not that it's an absurdity to have trillions of dollars in tax cuts for wealthy people out there at the same time you have all these needs and you're asking for another $87 billion in Iraq and that's a problem. It's ridiculous to have that and still go forward with the tax cuts. The difference is some of them say kill all the tax cuts and some of them say just kill the tax cuts for the rich. Well, the tax cuts for the super rich are a trillion dollars. Settle for that. Say, listen, we all agree on this. We want to take at least that. Now, there are some who want to take more. Terrific. But our position is we should take at least those trillion dollars. And, and uh, on Iraq, we can do the same kind of, of uh, it's not much of a compromise, but arriving at a mid-position in any event. One of the reasons the dialogue is not going in as nourishing a way as I wish it would is because of the mechanical problem. Too many voices speaking at the same time. Too little time. Debates, I, uh, you know, debates are about as good a method as we have, but it's terrible. You get a minute to talk about abortion, to talk about tax cuts, when you're talking about trillions of dollars, to talk about single payer, to talk about stem cells. You're supposed to talk about when life begins in a stem cell and why you can't have them in one minute. Or worse yet, on a television commercial in 24 seconds. And that's the way we communicate. And, and, and that's the reason that the, the conversation isn't as satisfying. The debate isn't as satisfying. And they, they lapse into slogans and they lapse into simplistics. When we yearn for something else, we want ideas that are good and sound instead of ideas that just sound good. We want big ideas that get to the fundamental values that we should hold as a nation and the direction we should take, ideas that will lift our aspirations instead of lowering them. I can't believe, for example, as some suggest, and some actually suggest this, I, I get it all the time in debating Republicans, that we should be satisfied with the kind of nation we had for 150 years, from 1789 to 1932, when there was no Medicare or Medicaid, that was better because that was a period of rugged individualism. And we've been spoiled since then. No, I, I, I think, I think uh, if we had a good debate, most people in this country would agree that we should demand ideas and principles that elevate our nation onto the high ground of our very best possibilities. And that's what happened seven decades ago when Franklin Roosevelt, in the midst of the Depression, as I've said before, lifted himself from his wheelchair to lift this nation from its knees. By doing what? By supplementing the market system. By saying the Constitution doesn't provide for it, but the Constitution doesn't say you should love one another either. The Constitution just made us free. It didn't talk to us about ethics or moral obligations or even practical obligations to help one another when we're in trouble. New York State's Constitution talks a little bit about the poor and education, but the United States Constitution says nothing. And so for all these years, we've gone without it. You didn't have Medicaid or Medicare until 1965. What? That's right. 
until 1965. There was nothing in the Constitution that said, look, if old people are dying and they can't take care of themselves, that's a sin, especially if you've built the railroads and made it all the way to the Pacific and you're already an industrial giant and you came out of the industrial age as number one in the world, you should be able to take care of your old people and your sick people who are poor, not to mention poor people who need an education. But there was nothing about public schools, nothing about Medicare, nothing about Medicaid, nothing about any help. Roosevelt made it up. And he interpolated it into the system, and that was progress. And we have continued to do that ever since. We have continued to make interventions on the market system, not by defying the market system. We've made some interventions to pay a price for the sins of the market system. Resolution Trust Corporation. We took billions of dollars out of your pocket, your pocket, your pocket, and my pocket to take care of a market system that failed and to give the people who bet on free enterprise, you know, give them their money back. And that was good for us. That's GI Bill of Rights, the interstate highway system, that's Eisenhower, the space program, and on and on and on. These were all good things to do, very good things to do. And the best and biggest of them might have been this. And it shows you that these are good things to do, not just because they are compassionate, which is, should be enough reason for all of us, but not, sadly, and I talk from experience, very hard to sell a program in this state or in this country by saying, look, this is the right thing to do, and it's compassion, and said, that's what makes you a mushy-headed liberal. But there's another reason for why the Marshall Plan was so good. It was because it is highly pragmatic and intelligent. We did the Marshall Plan because we needed the Marshall Plan. Look at what happened. Six million Jews, maybe more, in the Holocaust and others by the Nazis. December 7, 1941, the Japanese, in the middle of the night, bombed us. And what was there but revulsion and anger and hate and, on the part of the Americans? And we won the war. And I remember the Second World War. I remember particularly the women in the neighborhood putting those flags up in their windows with the blue star in them, which meant he's gone, my husband, my son, my brother. He's gone off to the service. And then off to the synagogue they go and off to St. Monica's Church and they pray for Luigi or Zeke or whoever it is. And then one day, all of a sudden, you see that there's a gold star there instead of a blue star. And that means he's not coming back. And then you hear the wailing in the synagogue and the cursing and praying in the church. You know, why, why, why me, Lord? Why him? He was so young. He was so beautiful. When those people were told after the Second World War they were going to spend billions of dollars to bring Germany back to life and Italy and Europe, they didn't stand up and cheer and say, that's the compassionate thing to do. Believe me, not in my neighborhood, not in South Jamaica. But it was the intelligent thing to do. Why? Because everybody profited. We needed them as trading partners. We're doing the same thing with the Russians now. After fighting all through the Cold War, spending trillions of dollars to buy missiles to pile them so high that we frighten them into submission. Remember the Reagan years. Now all of a sudden, we're taking money and we're going to help the Russians? Why? Because if you don't help them, you might have chaos and they still have nuclear weapons. If you hadn't helped the Germans, if you hadn't helped Europe, if you hadn't helped Japan, we wouldn't have had anybody to trade with. And there might have been chaos and other wars. That's why we do it, because it's intelligent. It's the idea of family. It's why you went from the confederation that didn't work to the Constitution, because 13 states just loosely uh, confederated, they weren't close enough. There wasn't enough synergism. There wasn't enough sharing. So you tie them together more tightly. Through all those exercises in, in intelligent synergism, we made this the most glorious, successful nation in the world. That's what we have to continue to do. We should take our inspiration from 9-11. There's a great lesson for us there. And the inspiration is this. It comes out of the awful, stunning contrast of these mad people who hated us so much 
they would give up their own life just to take ours. The fright of it, the shock of it. Like, oh, just, you hate me so much, you will kill yourself just to take me. That's chilling and, and, and disconcerting, to put it mildly, but re that's responded to by hundreds of guys from Jones Beach and Bell Harbor and South Jamaica and the Bronx and Manhattan firemen all loaded up with equipment, charging into the smoke and the flames, you know, not asking any questions, not knowing uh, what they were going to find there, but just because maybe there'll be a human being in there that we can save. And our commitment to humanity is so great, they never say these things, they never make speeches, they never even articulate it, they make jokes about it. But way down deep, the only thing they can be saying is, we love humanity so much, we will give our life to save it. That should be our inspiration. Because that was a dramatic and ineffably beautiful illustration of that simple, big idea that's strong enough to serve as the foundation of all of our policies of self-government. An idea as old as the idea of family, and we've seen its good effects over and over and over, but we failed in 2001, and we failed recently to use that idea. We mustn't fail again. We have to make a whole new start by strengthening our whole nation, at the same time increasing our capacity to do more for the rest of the planet. How do you strengthen the whole nation? It's not hard. Unless I'm lying to you about the numbers and I'm not, there's a trillion dollars there. Hasn't been spent yet. Let's take it. Let's take it and use it. Use it for those people without health care. Use it for those states and cities like New York and California and all the other states and cities that have had to raise taxes and lay off firemen and lay off police because they have deficits. Help them out. You have a trillion dollars. Pay the bill in Iraq with that trillion dollars. Give more tax cuts to the people who need it and will spend it right away instead of giving it to me and my clients at Wilkie, Farr, and Gallagher. <laughs> well, I'll have to speak just for myself on that one. <laughs> hey, spend, spend some of it, spend some of it, spend some of it on home defense. You've talked about it. You've created a big agency. But, well, let me, let me tell you about home defense. Think of New Year's Eve. Think of Teterboro Airport. Think of a little plane at Teterboro Airport loaded with a big bomb. Fly it over 42nd Street and crash it on a million people. How do you stop that? You can't right now. I've asked all the experts. What about all those cargoes? Containers, go down to Red Hook, where you see the containers. Nobody's checking them. What about the railroads? Another tragedy of 9-11, some of those firemen, some of those police didn't have the proper equipment. We all know that now, we all heard that. The radios didn't work, this didn't work. That's ridiculous, that's terrible. Uh, there are so many things we have to do, and that's where you'd have to start in fighting terrorism, is making ourselves safer at home. You need more intelligence. You need more of a, so. And as to the war, terrorism, in a nutshell. Because we can speak about all of this stuff in the question and answer period. Do you need force to win the war against terrorism? Of course. Why? Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Jamal, Islamia, all the others, you have to get them because they are lethal tumors. Lethal. You have to get them, you have to extirpate them, you have to destroy them. And that will take force. But that will not win the war against terrorism. You can't win the war against terrorism with force alone. Why? It is not our army against their army. Our army against their army wins every time. We, because there is no army to match our army. But it's not like that. They're not an army. They're not a nation. They're millions, perhaps, of people who hate us. 
many of them from the Arab world, but not exclusively. And they hate us, and they're working to destroy us and to kill us. And we can't get at them just by extirpating tumors because there, there is a perverse reaction to that. Look at Israel. You kill one of these terrorists, and it produces other terrorists almost automatically. You can't frighten people who are eager to give up their life to take yours by saying, we're going to kill you. Something else obviously is needed, not to put aside all force. No, we will need it. Force has its place, regrettably, but it has its place. But we need to do more. We have to find out precisely what their problem is and deal with it. We have to deal with Israel and Palestine and the Palestinians. Why? Because that's a provocation beside killing Israelis and killing Palestinians and threatening the existence of Israel because they can weigh you down by attrition, for God's sakes, unless we do something. And so we, we must deal with that for those reasons, but also because it is used by many Arabs to stoke fear and anger in the Arab world. So we have to get back to that, and we have to be more assertive. President Bush is now walking away from it again. That's where he started, and now he's walking away from Israel again. I think we ought to be walking toward it. I think we ought to get the British and everybody else and say, hey, look, we need to work even harder on peace here. Because now it's not just the Palestinians and the Israelis, it's us. Because now we're implicated. Up until 9-11, you know, we were trying to keep peace between them because we didn't want to see them kill ourselves. We love Israel. We created Israel. Israel's like us. They have the same values. All of that's still true. But there's an additional dimension now. They use you as an excuse to kill us. So all of us are involved. Everybody who's vulnerable to world terrorism should be, you know, working there. And we have to do that. We have to stop the Saudi Arabians from giving money to madrasas that teach people, young people, to kill the infidels, the Jews and the Christians of the West. We have to work on economic programs for them. Any ghetto in the United States, any ghetto in the United States where there is poverty, where there is uh, oppression uh, of various kinds, is a breeding ground for trouble of all kinds, including crime. That's true in you know, the president's own message of 2002 in which you talk about preemptive war has an intelligence section too. And it, <laughs> it says we ought to democratize, democratizing that part of what's happening in Iraq will be a good thing. Two good things, getting rid of Hussein and democratizing Iraq if it is possible. That would be a very, very good thing for Israel and for the whole world because if we could get them to democratic or near democratic status, they would be less likely to pick wars with one another and with us. And so all of that must be done and it can be done. Look, let, let, let me try to, to conclude this way and then we'll get particularly into Israel a little more heavily in the Q&A. There are so many things to talk about and I could go on and on with the specifics, but I, I'm not going to, we don't have the time. Most of all, we should concentrate on the big ideas that should rationalize our conduct, the, the bright stars that show us the way past the dangerous waters and the hidden boulders. And I, I've been looking for most of my life, my adult life anyway, for that. You know, what, what are the big ideas? What, what is it about us that keeps us so primitive, keeps us fighting one another, keeps us hating one another, keeps us misunderstanding one another, keeps us abusing our wealth, keeps, keeps us fragmenting this society. I was, you know, I thought, gee willikers, from what I, I'm reading here, we're going to go from the slime to the sublime, the slime of creation, you know, and this world is going to grow up to a higher level of civility in fits and starts, yes, but inexorably upward toward a greater, more beautiful life by integration, not fragmentation. By, by working us together, by synergizing. You know, why can't we do that? What's happening? The hardest and biggest question that came out of 
was not what happened to the intelligence, uh, who did this, uh, how do we fight them. For me, and I, I said this, I think, on Diane Sawyer's show two days after it, the hardest question, especially for religious people or, or people who are trying to meet the need that religion hasn't met for them, you know, an explanation for who you are, where you come from, what, what's it all about, Alfie? That's still the big question. And after 9-11, it was, why would any good force, call it God, call it whatever, why would it permit this kind of horror to innocent people? The same question you ask when a child dies in a crib. Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? And you read the rabbi's book, and it's a wonderful book. And you read Teilhard de Chardin, page 85 of The Divine Milieu, and he tries to explain evil in the world, and, and, and none of the explanations work. None. And, and so you, you say to yourself fitfully, well, my, you know, so, so, so where is there an answer? How do I reconcile myself to this situation? What counts? What matters? And finally, I think to most of us, what, what you conclude is, well, what matters is the next breath I can draw. What matters is my life. What matters is that I still have it. The one value I'm absolutely sure of is this gift of life that God or it or the thing or whatever gave me and that I still have. And that's the important thing. And now what I have to do is make the most of that life. A lot of people felt this way after 9-11. I still do. Make the most of it. Well, how? There were, there were a couple of choices. I mean, the, the obvious one is, well, I'll think of myself as a basket of appetites. And I'll spend my time filling up the basket. I like alcohol, this, women, hair, dancing, partying, travel. Okay, there's that too. But then you look in the mirror and say, my basket's getting old. <laughs> and I'm getting old, you know, and I, I'm having trouble filling up the basket. <laughs> and you say that, and that doesn't seem right. That doesn't, it can't be justified by that. So I'll play and I'll party and I'll die. And but, uh, that's not enough. And the second choice is a better one. And that is, look. I want to make as much of my life as I can. I want to take the good, solid things that I love so much, my family. You know, I, 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 I want to do, I, I, we, we have, well, here's what we have. We have intelligence. And I think a lot about religion. I've read a lot about religion, looking for answers, because I'm like a lot of you, you know. I, I've seen a lot of life, a lot of it beautiful and a lot of it ugly. And, and I'm left with questions, because I'm simple-minded and I, and you can get tortured by these questions. But here in the last part of my life, I've concluded that maybe it's very, very simple. Maybe even all the religions are very, very simple. And I, I thought one day, and, and this, is, this is a good place for it. Let's, let's take the people in this room, say a thousand people. The whole world is just you and I, about a thousand people on a lush island, lush with life every kind of life, you and I and the animals and the greens and the, every vegetation, every kind of life. And we have no history and no books and no education, just our rationality, just our intelligence. We're, we're what we are now, but without a book, without somebody with a beard coming down a mountain with a tablet that instructs us, without any structure. And so we look around and we see, well, you know, we have things in common. We both stand erect, the hair's coming off our body, and some of it's coming off our head, but it's going to... And, 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 and we talk and we communicate and we, we have this in common. And, and there are animals out there that we eat to nurture ourselves, and there are animals out there that want to eat us. And, and, and so we have this in common, the thousand of us. And so the natural intelligent thing would be for us to go to one another and say, look, we're like kinds. We have the same instincts, the same needs. We love this life we have, and we want it to be created and projected and improved. So let's get together. So we all meet together and we say, great, we've decided. We call ourselves something. Human beings, great. We're human beings. Terrific. And so we're all going to like one another, yes, and respect one another, yes, and help one another, of course, because we have comparable needs and desires. Terrific. That's common sense. Call it tzedakah if you're a Hebrew, because that's what it is. And then have, at your first meeting, you'd look around and say, okay, all right, we got that clear. We're calling it tzedakah. And uh, 
We all love one another, and we're going to treat one another as brothers and sisters because it's good for us. We're pragmatists. We're smart people. We want to live in this lush island well. Great. Okay, now, all you like kinds. Anybody here know, know where we came from? Well, there's any, can you figure out? Well, maybe that thing that comes up in the morning, you know, big, yellow, the heat heats everything up. Ah, no, nah, why? Whatever it is, no, I don't, I don't see any nose. I don't, no, it can't be that. Well, then what, where do we come from? We don't know. Where are we going? Well, we don't know. Well, couldn't you give me an, oh, yeah, I can give you an explanation, and we'll call it faith, because I don't have knowledge. If we had knowledge, we wouldn't need faith. But I don't know. I mean, I, I make it up. I said, we came. I read here. That's pretty good. I need something. So, oh, I'm a Catholic. But the, uh, that, that's faith. In the end, you don't really know anything but this. You want to keep going for as long as you can and making it as good as you can make it. And it's not good enough yet because it's raining on your head because you don't have protection. And because some of the children are dying because, you know, we didn't get to them early enough when they were first born. And some of us are being eaten by those animals because we're not protected. And some of us are fighting with one another. So we know the place isn't perfect. What we know is it needs repair. That's right. Tikkun olam. Repair the universe. That's right. That's right. And you got there without a rabbi, without a priest, without a book, without a message written. You got there just from your natural reason. So you can call it natural law. And when you go to the Christians, years and years later and say, boy, we had this hell of a meeting on a beach once, a thousand of us. We came up with these two great principles. Yeah, what are they? Oh, that's the same as ours. What's yours? Well, I'm a Christian. And when they stopped the founder of my religion in the street one day and challenged them and said, how did you dazzle the rabbis last night? They're all talking, yakking. You're such an important young uh, rabbi. What did you tell them? He says, look, I know you're putting me on. I'll give you the whole answer in a 10-second commercial. He couldn't look at his watch. He looked up the sun. I got a little time. I'll give you 10 seconds. Here it is. Here's the whole law. Rabbi Hillel had the whole law. Here's the whole law. Love one another as you love yourself for the love of me. And I am truth. And the truth is God made the world but did not complete it. And we ought to be collaborators in creation. That's tzedakah and tikkun olam. So, I'm a Jew. <laughs> and that's the whole law. That is good enough for any religion. Incidentally, those two predicates, are they not? No, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I like this idea because it's so simple and it, it calms me and assures me. Maybe I'm wrong, but think about it. Aren't they the two basic principles of Judaism, of Christianity, of Islam? of Hinduism, of Shintoism, of Confucianism, of Buddhism, of all the religions that are theistic and all the religions that are not, the ethical humanists? Don't all the people who call themselves religious believe in that? They believe in many other things, perhaps, that might separate them, but they believe in those two beautiful principles, and wouldn't they work politically, those principles? We're all in this together, the Arabs and the rest of us. We're all in this together, and we should be working together to make the world better for all of us. I think in the end it's as simple as that. Not perfect, because we're not perfect. But the formula is there. The rules are there. We should try harder to follow them. Thank you so much for listening. Zakaria's very good book, The Future of Freedom. He tells a story of interviewing someone and asking a question about the Democratic Party. And I was stunned by the answer, and it's haunted me ever since. And the answer was, there is no Democratic Party anymore. 
Uh, my question to you, is that true? And if so, what can be done about it? Well, there, I mean, uh, not to be simplistic about it, there is obviously a Democratic Party in name, nominally. I guess the point that was being made is we do not have a Democratic Party in the sense that we do not have a set of prescriptions that are so clear that they identify us intellectually as standing for things. We don't have a set of policies. I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic, and I could, I could reach into my pocket and take out the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, et cetera, et cetera. And I could recite it for you in about 30 seconds, and that would define me as a Roman Catholic pretty, pretty well. I mean, not, not completely, but well enough. And so I have an identity. You can't do that as a Democrat. You can't do it as a Republican, frankly. You can't do it with any of the political parties. And you can't do it with labels. For example, you try getting by by calling yourself a liberal or a conservative. But the assumption there is that that label will describe accurately your position on all the major issues. And it doesn't. What would Clinton be? You remember he said, the era of big government is over? Is that liberal or is that conservative? Well, no, that's conservative. So the labels, don't, you, you know how you can tell for sure they don't work? The 2000 election. Well, because uh, Governor Bush was a conservative from Texas. But when he came to run, he called himself a compassionate conservative, as distinguished from what? <laughs> and, and, and if... If you needed the word compassionate, this muck-up, mitigating word, why? And the Democrat wasn't a Democrat. He was a new Democrat, as distinguished from what? From me. I'm a very old <laughs> Democrat. <laughs> uh, the, and, and I was asked about this once, and, and, and uh, I, I, this is the answer, really. I mean, it's a big question, but I was asked about this once, and... and uh, Yale University, I gave a speech, a portissimove, Galileo, and we were talking about politics. And I said, what's in a word? You know, Galileo said, okay, if that's what you want me to say, I'll say it. The, the sun, the, you know, the earth doesn't move, the sun moves, any way you want it. Uh, because it's only language. I said, if I ever run again, the way I want to run is as a representative of the common, uh, Thomas Paine Common Sense Party. And I will call myself a progressive pragmatist. <laughs> and they will say, well, what does a progressive pragmatist say about the one big political issue that defines us? What is the role of government? And I would say, OK, fair question. I believe in only the government we need. And all the conservatives would cheer. But I insist on all the government we need. And then all the liberals would cheer. And then they would say, well, he's a wise guy. He told us nothing, which would be absolutely true. <laughs> but then for four years, every decision I made would be a dot. And they would join the dots. And in four years, they would have a decision plate. Because they say, aha, we got him now. See, here's the form he takes. And at that point, I would announce, I have become a neo-progressive <laughs> pragmatist. <laughs> and I, I think so. so it's very difficult to say what a Democrat is. That's why I talk about the chorus. Now, now, you heard some of the Democratic ideas here today. I think I could make of those, and so could you, I mean, if you chose to, five, six, seven ideas that we all agree to. They would be general, but not that general. On the question of the economy, we would say the economy is terrible. You see, I don't think the Bush administration wants to improve the economy. We're now having an economic recovery without jobs, right? No, that's what they call it, a jobless recovery. Why? Well, that's why I told you about the skilled and unskilled. You know, you have only 20% of your people skilled in a high-skilled world. You needed 200,000 200, visas a few years ago to get computer engineers here. So don't be surprised you're using India to do a lot of that work for you now. So that, 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 that's, that's one thing. Anyway. 
I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to spend too much more time on that. The, uh, but that, that's one issue. You can take jobs. You can take uh, the, uh, the uh, education. You can take the taxes, the $1 trillion. You can take Iraq. We have to get out right away. We have to internationalize Iraq. We should sc uh, spread the cost and instead of doing it all ourselves. Uh, you can take energy. You can say one of the problems we have is we're insisting on a dependency on Middle Eastern oil. We always have presidents from long before Carter, all the way back, said get off Middle Eastern world. They wrote a great book in 1974 or 5 and in Harvard called Energy Future. They said if you keep depending on that oil, you'll go to war over it. Everybody knows it, and we're still dependent on that oil. Why? Because we like it that way. Because there are people in this country who make money from those situations. And we should work very, very hard. Now, that should be a, that should be a democratic uh, proposition. The environmental issue, Social Security and Medicare, these are all legitimate uh, democratic ideas. And I think you could string together a body of belief. One good person to do it for you would be President Clinton, frankly. And, uh, but I, and I've suggested this publicly before, and they, they say it's very hard to do because the candidates want to distinguish themselves. Well, you can do both. You can say, look, here's a body of principles we all agree on. And here are some deviations that I'm, you know, I'm special. Uh, Mario wants to take just the money from the top 1% or 2%. I want to take it all even from the middle class and give them health care in return. Okay, that's your distinction. You can run that way. But you agree with me too, right? So that I can quote you as a Democrat who believes you should take the money from the top 1% or 2%. Yeah. So you can have your little pluses and you can, you can distinguish yourself or try to that way in Iowa, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's what they're saying. You can't identify Democrats today in terms of the position, the ideology, and that's a problem. And the only way to solve it is either the way I'm talking about now, get a chorus going now, or wait until you get a winner of the primary, hope, hope that the winner is somebody you agree with, and then go with him. But that's a very chancy thing. That's a very chancy thing. You might get the wrong person in the primary. And I think our strongest suit is the issues. I think our strongest suit is not the persona, it is the policies. I think they were our strongest issue in 2000 as well. And we won, Democrats did, the total number of votes. I think, I think they'll, they'll be even stronger this time. But you have to r write them, state them, repeat them from now until the election, not to lose them. Yes. Um, we have a few questions from the Jewish Community Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that have arrived via email. Uh, one of them is submitted by Marion Waterst Waterston, and she says, I've wondered for so many years why you haven't run for national office. <laughs> if you ever decide to, you have my vote here in New Mexico, and I'll work on your campaign. Did she give you an address? <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you uh, very much. That's a wonderful town, Albuquerque. I, I, I have been there. Uh, I have been everywhere since you elected me a private citizen. You know? <laughs> but that's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sir, hi. Um, as a proud Democrat, I'm looking for hope to get the Democrats back in office. I see that the country, I, I hope I see this, and I wanted to ask you if you see it, are dissatisfied, they are dissatisfied, people in this country are dissatisfied with politics as usual, with Dean and Clark being ahead of the forefront of the race of the Democratic candidates, but also as Schwarzenegger winning as a wake-up call for Bush, saying there's a bigger problem here, Californians are sick of what's happening in this country. Do you think that this, the people in this country are changing, that they're getting more aggressive, that, and that 
people are, are becoming aware of what's happening and that things will change? And then also, do you think that the more aggressive tactics of Dean and just Clark being this fresh candidate that's not, not part of the current Congress or, um, is, is something that's good for the Democrats and can be the next wave and help us get back the White House? I, I think it is good when you have new people, new faces, new ideas, new energy. I think it is essential that the energy have propositions to carry. And the propositions are what win for you in the end. What your policies are going to be. You have to distinguish yourself from President Bush. Not that you're better looking or nicer than he is or a better speaker than he is. But that you have a better approach. You have a better approach to Iraq. You have a better approach to the economy. You have a better approach to the environment. And you have to be able to say it in baby talk. Here's what he believes. Here's what I believe. And, and that is even more important than the newness of the face, et cetera. Al Gore, in my opinion, could have come in and been a very strong candidate here because of the issues. Now, in 2000, by Al Gore's own admission, he did not run the best race he's capable of. He's much better in debate than he was in the debates there, et cetera, et cetera. But what won it? Oh, despite the fact that he didn't have a really good campaign, and people liked Bush. You know, in the Northeast, he's not as well liked as he is in the rest of the country. But I am telling you, you know, in the NASCAR part of the world, outside of, no, 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 you see? That's where you are. <laughs> they like him, and there are a lot of people out there that like him. So you need positions. Now, I didn't want to get too deeply into this. This is why I backed away from it. But let me, let me go back to it. I don't think the Bush administration issues, if, if people are excited and they're angry and they're upset, that's good. If we have their attention now, we should be giving them the truth in simple language. President Bush doesn't care about this jobless recovery. Why? The parts of this economy that are doing well are very good to President Bush. And there are parts of the economy that are doing well. And they are the parts that don't need the 160 million workers to be consumers. So it doesn't hurt them that they don't have money to spend. For example, pharmaceuticals. That money gets spent. They're going to have to buy pharmaceuticals whether they like it or not. If they have to steal the money, they have to buy the pharmaceuticals. Okay? Oil. Media. See, these are all things that make money notwithstanding what? Real estate, because the interest rate is low, they're building houses like crazy. The interest rate is very, very low, and, and you know, the, they're out there selling houses. All, real estate kept us from really plummeting in the recession. Now, all those people have, they've created a tidal wave of campaign money into the Bush Treasury. Just take a look at it. And he can get by. You can have an economy that I will bleed over and curse and say, gee, Willikers, now you're up to 10 million people out of, uh, out of work, and they'll be doing very well. And that's why, and we're different from them. We don't want to take care of just that thin bit of people. We want to take care of all the stores, all the retailers, everybody else, by taking care of the people of this country so that they're happy. When they're happy, all the stores will be happy, not just those selected industries that you know, do business no matter what happens. Now that, but, but that has to be explained to people. And it's not enough just to be a new face, yes. Governor, every time I hear you speak, I'm haunted by a certain day in 1992, when the airplane engines were warmed up, when you made a decision not to run in the primary in New Hampshire. We who have lived with you and through those years I, especially myself, if you don't mind, I worked on your mayorality campaign against Ed Koch, wondered why you didn't run for office at that time, and the young lady in Albuquerque is very right. We could use a leader like you. you. The, uh, I, 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 I don't want to waste a lot of time on 92. I'll tell you again, but I, I said it over and over and over, and it never left any impression on anybody. In 19, <laughs> 1991, I guess it was actually, it was actually 91, 92 was the election, but this happened in the fall, I think, of 91. 
Uh, Matilda and I did say finally, after people said you're first in the polls, this, 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 we said, okay, we'll look at it. We had never discussed it. I have, uh, I have my daughter in the audience, and she would tell you if you could find her that, uh, you know, Dad never once talked about the presidency. We never discussed it in the House. It just wasn't an issue. Why? I was busy being the governor. I didn't have illusions about myself. Uh, Abe Rosenthal once said to me, well, yeah, I don't think you have the fire in the belly for the presidency. I said, Abe, show me a guy who wants to be president because he has a fire in his belly. I'll spritz him with seltzer in the mouth. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I didn't have that. I said, I don't want somebody with fire in the belly because that would suggest a certain egoism. I got to have it. I got to have it. I got to have it. Uh, and I, it wasn't like that with me. I, I, but people said, will you take a look? We took a look for a couple of months. They came back. They said, wow, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of everything. And I said very clearly, look, the state's in big trouble, which we were. We were having a recession and we were hurting. I said, if I can get the Republicans who have owned the Senate in this state for over 70 years, they're in charge of the Senate. You can't get anything done without them. If I can get the Senate <clears throat> to agree to make a budget with me and I'll make the budget, I'll leave for New Hampshire immediately. And I said to the uh, Republicans in the Senate, Ralph Marino was leading it. Look, Ralph, you make a budget with me, a 15 month budget. It was nothing. We were separated by $250 million, which, believe me, in a budget that was $30 billion, you could figure out a way to do that. And I said, you can't lose, Ralph. I'll go run. All you people think that Mario Cuomo from the Northeast couldn't possibly win because Bob Novak says there are no, Mar Cuomo, no Marios down south. I said, so, you know, so you'll beat me, and then I'll be finished, and you can uh, do what uh, you want without me. On the other hand, if I win, I'll be a New Yorker who's president of the United States. How can that be bad for you? Whatever you are, you know, Republican, Democrat in New York. And so I thought that that would be good and they would uh, do it. They wouldn't make the budget. I said, if they don't make the budget, there's no point in my trying. Because as soon as I go to New York, there'll be a headline in the New York Times that will say he leaves the state abandoned. The Republicans say we have no budget. Now we can't borrow what we need for, to do this, to do that, because there is no budget. And that was the end of it. I said that. I said it clearly. Did anybody believe it? Nobody. <laughs> why? I don't know why. And, and, that, and I'll tell you, for two years, two years I was asked about, will you run, won't you run? I never said absolutely no for exactly that reason. And, and a reporter asked me. I always said the same thing. I had a little prescription. I have no plans to run and no plans to make plans. And they said, oh, that's cute. No plans, no plans to make one. Why don't you just say no? Because then you'll think of 15 evil reasons why I'm not running. And that's exactly what happened. The first one was organized crime. You know, with a name like Mario Cuomo, well, that's what it must be, you know, organized crime. And then it was colon cancer. You know, somebody, a rumor, he has colon cancer. The only answer, thing they didn't accuse me of was a 28-year-old blonde girlfriend, and I've resented it ever since. <laughs> Yes, sir. Governor, thank you. It's a pleasure to hear a leader speak in complete sentences. <laughs> but trying to tie together both your pragmatic descriptions of Democrats, Republicans, and Tikkun Olam, what do you think of Michael Bloomberg's idea about nonpartisan primaries and voting for people on issues as opposed to which political leader put them up? I, I, I frankly have not paid a lot of attention to it. I'm not sure. I, I, I lean against it. I think the primary, although, uh, you know, I, I succeeded virtually outside the system. I was not the choice of the Democrats, not in the mayoral race in 1977, not in the governor's race in 1982. I had to run against the party both times in the, in the primary. So, but but I, I have a general sense that the primary is better, uh, the primary system is better than, than doing it the other way, although I haven't studied it enough. I think from the mayor's point of view, uh, a practical uh, note, I think perhaps he made a mistake associating himself with the idea because I think it's gonna be taken as a referendum on the mayor. And uh, I think that would be too bad because I, I expect it would lose and if it loses, then I'm afraid they're going to say it's the mayor 
who loses. And I think that's unfortunate because the mayor is doing, I think, for the most part, the only things he can do given the mess that was left him when he took this office over. And uh, now, having, having been there and having seen my own polls go down terribly, you know, I, I set two records for popularity uh, in elections. I re no, I really did. The two highest margins of victory uh, in the history of the state, number one and number two, are mine. On the other hand, in between, you know, when you had bad times, you go down. Why? Because the people properly say, if things are good, then we're going to give you the credit because what else, what other measuring rod do we have? What other, what other criterion do we have? You're in charge, things are good. Well, now, the person in charge isn't responsible for the status quo. I mean, he may or she may have contributed to it, but almost always, it's things that happen before them, things that happen around them. Uh, that's the truth. The political reality is they hold you responsible. And so he's taking a lot of hits because he raised the taxes, he did this, and they say, well, you did the bad thing, I'm going to uh, get rid of you. Okay, uh, this will only make it worse, I think. They're running this um, initiative, whatever, whatever they call it, uh, I think may hurt him if it goes down. So I'm sorry he did it. But I, I can't give you a good opinion on it. I haven't studied it. I really haven't. The political process, that fine a political process, has never been the thing I was most interested in. Perhaps I should have been. But it wasn't something I ever did. I didn't know what the rules were. Um, I came in, I did my thing. Andrew, my son, took care of almost all that thinking for me. And I, I never got involved with it. I was I tried concentrating on the uh, the issues. Yeah. Good evening, Governor Cuomo. It's a pleasure to listen to you. We've missed your leadership for such a long time. Um, your wonderful speech of a tale of two cities in mid 1980s. Are we better off? I know you touched on the numbers, the shining city on a hill. Are we worse off? And are we always going to have two cities anyway? The you know, governor has to explain that a little bit. What, what is your name? Nazi. Say again? Nazi Moinian. What's your second name? Moinian. How do you spell it? M-O-I-N-I-A-N. Moinian. What nationality, if I may ask? Persian. Persian. Wonderful. The, um, if you hadn't added that coda, it would have been a lot easier. What was the last thing you asked for? Are we always going to be two yeah. cities, a city on a shining hill? And we are now worse than two cities. We are now more fragmented than we ever have been in terms of economy. The difference between the top, the middle, and the bottom is wider than it's ever been. 15, 20 years ago, CEOs were paid 15 times what workers were paid. Now they're paid 300 times what workers are paid. Um, we have 35, we have more poor people over the last few years. We still have 35 million poor people in the richest country in the world that's capable of giving back two and a half trillion dollars in taxes. You have 35 million poor people. It just, so, it is of the essence, apparently, of the free enterprise system that you have winners and losers, okay? It, is not truly of the essence, because you can have winners and losers take jobs now. In the free enterprise system, we're losing jobs to places where they can do the same work at much less money, okay? Uh, and so we're, we have nine million people out of work. Um, a lot of that is manufacturing jobs that are now being done in India, China, or Mexico, and around the world. Free enterprise, free trade, uh, and we want to keep that. But in a really rich country like ours, there are things you can do about that. You can give readjustment assistance. You can give special training. You can push the threshold in high tech, higher and higher, stay ahead of everybody else, producing products that only you can produce. And when they catch up to you with the, uh, that level of technology, then you go further up. That's the way we made it the first time around. You know, we used to make everything of value. 
all the hard stuff, the cars, the typewriters, the machinery, all of that. So there are things that a rich country can do that we're not even trying to do. So it's not necessary to have the two classes, but, but um, we're not trying hard to get rid of them. And the Bush administration couldn't care less. There is no other way. There is no other way. No, no, look, look. I, 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 I don't want to make any charges that aren't based on numbers that absolutely convince me. How else can you justify these tax cuts? Just think about it. Now, I, I'm not, you know, obsessed by them. They are that important because they say so much about this country. How can you have the squalor? How can you have the woman who can't afford health insurance and give away a trillion dollars to the richest people and say you don't need it? How do you do that? How do you explain it? So, it's aggravating that we still have this fragmentation. We don't need to have this fragmentation. Read a really good book on it by Kevin Phillips. Kevin Phillips is a Republican who worked with Nixon. He wrote a book called The Politics of Rich and Poor in 1991. And there were two blurbs on the back. One was by President Nixon and the other was by myself. And I said about the book, this should have been written by a Democrat because it talked about fragmentation, etc. He has now written another one, made the bestseller list, I think last year, Wealth and Democracy, and he says all of this. What was the first part of the question now, beside the... Uh, I just was wondering if it's inherent in any capitalistic world to have the two cities. I mean, and I think you answered that already. All right, thank It doesn't you. have to be so different, that's what you Thank said. you. What do you do? <laughs> I am a mother, I'm a businesswoman and I'm married to a wonderful person. In you know, I, wait, I, I love the hierarchy. I really do. You, it's <laughs> absolutely right. You said mother, businesswoman, and you put him third. That was terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yes. Governor, you made the case uh, for the legitimate use of force against people who are so rejectionist and so hating. Uh, that only force could deal with them. And in the next breath, you spoke, I think, about the underlying causes that have to be dealt with right. as though this irrational hatred has a rational basis. Which is it? No, 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 no. It has to be dealt with because it doesn't have a rational basis. And therefore, it's, you can deal with it by pointing out the re lack of rationality. And you start with children. And by teaching them the truth. Um, so it can be dealt with. If, see, none of us are sure of precisely what the causes are. If you read uh, all the studies and Bernard Lewis and all this stuff, you, you come to the conclusion that some of it is religious. You know, some of it is just people who remember the Crusades in which the Christians did one of the most horrible things ever done in the name of God and religion. I mean, what they did to the Muslims uh, you know, is, is a disgrace, no question. So some of it is that. Some of it is Israel, but I think Israel was used more, as, is, is being used more. I mean, Arabs are upset about the Palestinians, but I think they're, they're, they're exploiting the Israeli question. A lot of it is oppression. A lot of it is uh, the way we have handled our foreign policy. For example, you bring Osama bin Laden into Afghanistan, you get him to help you, and then you walk away from him when it's all over and you leave him for dead. And he resented that, and he said so. And you know, our foreign policy in many cases has been very exploitive of other people. And we're paying a price. Now there's, there's an Australian who wrote a piece on it and, and recited it in the United Nations a couple of years ago, and it was really extraordinary. He said, why do people hate the United States? And he obviously didn't, and Australia doesn't, but he made the case very specifically and gave reasons for it. We have to deal with that. Now, that doesn't mean you get soft with them. There is a certain amount of force you have, but you're not going to win this war with force. That's obvious. How? Can Sharon win it with force? Can you stop these people with force? No, you can slow them down, maybe. You can, and we can, you know, kill their organizations, but you're not going to stop it just with force. You have to have something more. You have to get at the disease that's causing it. See, now what happens is, though, and I, I remember this so well, again, 9-11. You know, the next day, 
It wasn't AM New York. It was uh, one of the other morning shows. I said approximately this, big mistake. My son-in-law, Brian O'Donoghue, who's married to my daughter, Madeline, called me up because he heard the hateful comments that came back saying, what's wrong with that Cuomo? How can he talk about source and causes, et cetera? You know, kill the b bums. You know, he said, you picked the wrong time, he says, to, to say it. You can't say it now. Everybody's angry, et cetera, et cetera. And when you say, look, we have to look for the reason here and deal with the reason because that's the disease, that's absolutely correct. I'm certain of it. But People didn't want to hear it. Why? Because they're angry. And it sounds soft. I'm not suggesting you should be soft. I'm suggesting you should be smart. And, uh, and nobody else is. Why, why? Well, I mean, why aren't the po Look, why aren't all these smart Democrats saying what I'm saying? Because they're afraid it's going to sound soft. And because they're not saying it, we're losing the strength of this argument, which is a good argument. You see, you're not convinced. Long way from well, it. Hold it, hold it. Well, so tell me. Go ahead. <laughs> where, where is the reason? Uh, what, what particular program, what particular point would you go to to begin to deal with this um, hating position, this rejectionist position? Well, if it's based on... A think oh. you'd convince anyone in Hamas with something you could do if you decided, for instance, to give them everything from 1947, would that satisfy Hamas? Well, if, 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 the, if one of the bases is a misunderstanding of religion, then you instruct them in religion. If one of the bases is uh, Hamas, uh, let's say Israel, you know, th their, their position, which Israel ought not to exist, which is what it is, and which is what still Arafat's position, and which is where you have to start when you make this new, very assertive effort, the whole world, led by the United States in Israel, saying, listen, now we're in the game too, which is what I think should happen. There are a series of predicates. One has to be number one. You have to abandon this idea that you can get rid of Israel. You're not going to get rid of Israel. We created it. It exists legally. It will continue to exist, period. And the Arab League has to join you in that. Now, remember a while back the Arab League said they would. But you have to make that real. And then you have to work toward two states, yes, but real states. States that have an economy, that have an infrastructure, that will allow the Palestinians to make the desert bloom the way the Israelis have made the desert bloom. Perez's idea about a free trade zone, which everybody laughed at when I went to Israel in 1985, I guess it was, you know, I said, you're absolutely right. If ever the Palestinians, if ever we could work this out, this whole part of the world would be tremendously rich. The Palestinians are very smart people. You know, you could teach them, you could work with them. So, once you convince the Palestinians, and there are Palestinians who want to live in peace, who want their children to live in peace, who don't, who don't believe that we should stay here until we convince them to move to Nebraska. They're not going to move to Nebraska. They're going to stay here. You take it a point at a time and you work with it. The, uh, so what's your alternative? Tell me, what is your alternative? To kill every terrorist you can find? And you think more terrorists won't grow as a result of that? I don't, I don't think there is any alternative to what I'm saying. You must find the, the provocations and try to get rid of them. Now, in the end, when you do that Palestinian state, you need one other thing. If you gave them everything, an economy, infrastructure, which, which takes money, etc., but you should do it. That's what we're doing in Iraq, are we not? In Iraq, we all, Democrats and Republicans, are agreeing on one thing, and that is, all right, now that we're there, we're arguing about you shouldn't have been there, you lied about the web, but that's all gone. Now we're there, we want to make them a democracy, right? We're going to have to give them money for hospitals, for roads, for clinics, for schools. You have to do that. You can't put a $100 billion bill on their back for the reconstruction and say, now we're going to create a democracy. And your idea is if we democratize them, there'll be less instinct for terrorism. That's what you should do in Palestine. But once you do it, now you have a nation. 
no army, but a nation. Now you have to make sure they don't take that nation and make it Syria and start using it as a base for terrorists. There, the only thing you can offer them is a guarantee by the United States and whatever allies it can get, that don't worry, you know, we're here, and once that move is made, if anybody ever tries it, we'll be there to take care of it. Um, look, it's a matter of alternatives. We can't continue to do what we're doing now, which is throwing up our hands. You'll admit, won't you, that this administration is now walking away from Israel. Would you admit that? I'm not sure. Well, I'm then, not sure. all right, tell me, but, tell me <laughs> how do you see their position now? Actively involved? I, I see it wavering, and it looks... Ah. It, lo it looks, uh, it looks that's bad trouble. to me, but... Uh, that's what troubles me. See, that's what... We well, can't have... I don't hear anything different on your end of it, either. What do you mean you don't hear anything? What, what am I saying? Who am I talking about? <laughs> you, did, you mean he said everything I said? I'll vote for him. <laughs> well, he did said... He say for, <laughs> for one thing, he said that we can't do business with terrorist nations, and in the other breath, he did, had nothing to say about Arafat until very recently, and he hasn't said it with sufficient strength and with sufficient reiteration well, maybe, to make it work. Maybe this, I mean, is, maybe this is easier. Yeah. Do you have a plan? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Do you have an idea that we're missing here? I, I don't know about an idea, but I certainly think that uh, uh, once you take a position, uh, it doesn't help if you, if you abandon that position even though you think that position is right. You, if you appear to be wavering, that's a weakness right. that the other side will exploit. See, what, where you are now is where a lot of us are, and that is we don't know what to do next. And that I find intolerable well, I, because I, I think, I think you could lose next. Israel by attrition. I, I think, think you can yeah. lose Israel, but, you know, a little bit at a time. They don't get as many immigrants, and some of the people kind of get tired. And I mean, they, they've got steadfast people and, and wonderful people, and God bless them, and they've put up with this, and they win every war. And, but, but after a while, you know, I'm afraid the other side will wait a thousand years to, to win the thing. And, on, and you have to, you cannot just sit back and let it erode. It takes a new assertive move. And uh, I think, see, and I think the difference, I think the difference, the real difference is you now can take the rest of the world and say there is another dimension now. Now we're involved. See, this wasn't true before 9-11 the same way. Now that they're using Israel as an excuse for killing us and others, now the rest of the world can come in and say to both of them, look, now we're going to be more assertive than we ever were before. And that will open the, 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 the show to a lot of other moves that haven't been made yet. Does that make sense to you? What troubles me is a recent news item. Okay. okay? Just recently, there was... Yeah, well, this, see, this is not going to go down. No, no, but just, just recently. No, no, you're, you're okay. an intelligent, to, concerned just, person. We go need ahead. to move on to other questions. People. Have just recently, what occurred was a sports tournament in, in uh, Palestine. And the Palestinian Authority was the sponsor, and it was called the, Sh the Shahid Sports Tournament. That is, the, though, it honored those who had given up their lives as homicide bombers or suicide bombers. And each team of the 24 teams was named after either an organization or a bomber. And the winning team was awarded a cup in a beautiful speech lauding the activity of that martyr by no other than Saeb Erekat, who's in the cabinet. Now, with, with that kind of a regime and with that kind of a person who certainly is a spokesperson doing something like that, why is there uh, not a hiatus in the diplomatic side of it until there is a true reform in the regime instead of just another mock-up of an Arafat chosen group of cronies? So. So, so tell me what that produced. What, what do we do now to deal with that? I think we have to insist on 
a new government, free elections. I mean, Arafat was... A new was government, free elections, and of, in they'll Palestine. vote for Arafat. Well, perhaps. Arafat was elected last time after he delayed the elections and managed to get himself entrenched. He came from Tunis, whether he would well, have been choosing. Nobody chosen should be originally. surprised that we haven't come up with a solution here tonight. But thank you for trying. We only have time for a few more questions. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. And we have some people waiting patiently, so I'm let's sorry. keep the questions brief. And Hi, Governor Cuomo. Thank you for speaking tonight. I can't refer to him as our president because he wasn't elected and certainly not my president, so I refer to him as him. <laughs> Why? First, it's tied to the Democrats who did nothing to take any stand on any issue in 2002, and they deserve to lose both houses of Congress that way. But now we have to go to what they, they refer to as the liberal media, meaning print media and TV, because we know that radio is certainly all theirs. Why did they give him a pass constantly during the 2000 election, and now for two and a half years they are giving him a pass, and now when he said he really wants to get to the bottom of who leaked Joseph Wilson's wife's name, whereas today's paper, I think yesterday's paper said, but it has to go through him. He has to look at it, his staff, before all of that information that had a deadline on it. He's now going to scrutinize and only if it passes his muster will it go on. And the media, I think, will give him another pass. Why? What's your question? Why is the media give him a pass? They didn't bring up that he is the only one in this country that has a different driver's license after age 25, I believe it was, than anybody else because he had drunken driving convictions on there. How, excuse me, may, may I ask you something? How, uh, how, where did you learn that? There is information. I have it at from, home. From the media? No. Not oh, from not from the media. No. Not from the media. Not you from the sure? Media. Yes. No newspaper, magazine, no. television? No. Why, you have little spies work mm -hmm. for you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I. And they gave him a pass when he talk, I, when they I talked know, about I, cocaine and drugs and all. I know people say this all the time the media is skewing this, skewing that. Um, and and uh, maybe they are. The 2000, I think they were very hard on Al Gore, yes. and they were very easy on Bush. Yes. And I think that's because probably it made a better story. You know, Bush, uh, Bush, uh, they didn't like Al Gore. They really didn't. And they showed it. They're human beings, and they showed it. Should they have? No. They should be the Christian Science Monitor. I think the Christian Science Monitor, incidentally, is objective almost always. Uh, but but there, are, there are things, you know, you, you know, there are ways you can get to objectivity. All the stuff that you were describing with respect to Wilson, you got out of the media. You know, all, all the stuff about what he's going to do and what he's not going to do, you learned from the media. And so they are telling the story. Telling, and it, they don't say anything to him. But what do you mean say? No, they, you know, they are they don't reporting. Take a stand, a stand on it. I, I don't think our biggest problem is um, the people being corrupted by um, the media and its refusal to tell the truth. I think the difficulty is communication because the problems in many cases are complex. You see this, this, this exchange on Israel? We, we could be here for two right. hours and, right. and he could be absolutely right in everything he's saying and I could be partially right and still keep talking because it's that complicated. That's number one. Number two, the politicians don't want to deal with that kind of complexity. And so they reduce everything to slogans and to sound bites. And you get this simplistic delivery that distorts the truth. Now, again, I will say it because I want you to remember this if you remember nothing else about the talk. How did they get away with these tax cuts? The truth is, to this day, the people... I, I go all over the United States of America. I describe these tax cuts over and over, and you'll see people in the audience as the most intelligent. I was in Princeton for 11 hours on Thursday, 11 hours. Graduate students, young people, that's a great institution. And in some of the groups, I'd use this, and you'd see them saying, ah, no, it's like, can't be. Can't be. So 
It's, and it's not stupidity, God forbid, Princeton. The, you know, it's complicated stuff. And we're a distracted people. The politicians don't want to get involved in too many subtleties. Everything has to be bright letter and unequivocal. And that's the problem. You, you, you are not giving the people the whole truth. They're not receiving the whole truth. If they knew everything that I said tonight, if they knew it, we couldn't lose. In, uh, we really couldn't. If everybody knew the facts as I think I see them, I don't think we could lose an election. I really if, don't. If we get the Democratic vote out, it depends on who you get out to vote. You're right. Governor and ladies and gentlemen, we just have time for one more question. We could talk about these issues all night long, I'm sure, but let's just take one more from this man right here. And very quickly, um, why does George Pataki keep winning and can he be stopped? <laughs> well, I, I, I can tell you, I can tell you why he and Rudy both did well over their term. I, a lot of it depends upon what the conditions of your period are. In, uh, someone asked me once, uh, what was your, your most successful time in the governorship? I said, I think it was 1987 when welfare, we, we reduced welfare 17%, we gave a big tax cut, we did this, we did that. And um, he said, what was the worst time? I said, 1994 and 1983 when we had recessions. In the Pataki years and the Giuliani years, all the mayors and governors were riding a wave of abundance that came out of the federal economy. The four years from 1996 and a half to 2000 were the richest market years in our history. Those eight years were eight years of growth. They had so much money, they could cut taxes and be, uh, you know, and give you new programs at the same time because they had the wealth. Uh, poor George Bush didn't have it, the first George Bush, and because of that, he made a promise not to raise taxes because the economy was weak during his time, and let's be honest, it wasn't his fault that it was weak. He didn't make it weak, but because it was weak, he had to find revenues because the deficit got too big and he had to raise taxes and that defeated George Bush. Bill Clinton, 1993, <clears throat> got into big trouble with the hospitals, remember, and the health care plan. <clears throat> Just 1996, he won, <clears throat> but he didn't get a majority vote against Dole and Bob Dole I love. He's a wonderful guy, I really like him, but he was not a very strong candidate. We still didn't get 50% of the vote. A few years later, he couldn't lose, you know, anything. Why? Because the stock market went crazy. Everybody bought everything. We did 22 million jobs, had the biggest surplus in history, mirabile dictu, it came out of the heavens. And all of a sudden, you know, he was guaranteed a great legacy. God bless him. I'm delighted it happened. But that's the way these things happen. If you're there at the right, Mike Bloomberg, why is he at 30%? Instead of 70%, he's trying like heck, he's doing it because the situation is lousy. And if you're there when things are good, you do well in people's popularity. It's a miracle I survived, frankly, 12 years. No, it really is. It really is a miracle. Thank you very, very much. God bless you.